This would make a great gift for somebody. This is certainly great for your phone and for your tablet. Mike, what's the response been like since you launched these? Well, Adam, it's really been amazing. It's, it's profound to get to see an idea come from just on a drawing board to, I mean, seeing it in the wild, right? right? And to see a shark using my product yeah. and, and, and being so passionate about it. And so it's just awesome to, to tell people that they're able to do more in their life because the smartphones become such an integral part of our daily life. We carry it everywhere we go. We'll turn around and go back home to get it. Sure. But now this creates a comfortable connection to the phone. Uh, it's just like wearing it. It holds on to you so you don't have to hold on to it. And everybody just loves it. So I think it's perfectly named. Now, Damon, you've tried lots of these types yeah. of products. Why yeah. is this one better? I don't want to take up too much of his time because I can talk about this forever. Number one, you, you have, there's a very popular one this round, but yep. you can't run with that. Can I run with that? No. Nope. No. There's all the ones that are circle and they're metal. One of my friends actually broke their finger because it got stuck in the door and that metal did not move or give ow, at all. Ow. I also put this on my steering wheel of my car on the drive shift right here when I'm driving and I'm looking at uh, uh, Google Maps or sure. things of that nature. And again, you don't drop the phone in your face that morning when you're not supposed to look at the phone. You're supposed to kiss your significant other. <laughs> However, you're laying in the bed looking at the phone and all of a sudden bang it drops on your face i can talk about this thing forever yeah. guys we're going to show you the three different options that are available and then michael take us through in detail how you attach it and how you maximize it What's up? This is Eric Ong, and today I'm here with Mike Watts. Now, Mike Watts is a seasoned entrepreneur with six startup companies totaling over $60 million in sales. And he did a deal with Damon John without going on Shark Tank. Currently, he's serving as the founder and CEO of Love Handle, which is a USA-made smartphone grips. He's a two-time winner of the Aggie 100 and Fortune 5000 and regular guest on a variety of entrepreneurship-focused podcasts and broadcasts. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thank you for having me, Alaric. Great. Maybe you can start off with sharing more about the different startups you've done. How do you manage to get $60 million in sales? And then we can just go on from there. Yeah, well, you know, I've been a full-time entrepreneur for the last 16 years. I've been mm -hmm. an entrepreneur, I feel like, my whole life. Mm -hmm. I've continued to bring products to market, bring products to life. And some of the ones that you may have seen before, uh, I mean, I, I date back to the infomercial days when I was putting products on TV, late night mm -hmm. TV. We had an aftermarket weed eater head for all those weekend warriors that are cutting grass out there that are frustrated with winding the line on and feeding it out. We, we developed a product called the Pivot Trim that became a phenomenon and, and it hit number one in its category before we exited that company. Um, I have a patent on an underground tree stake that's used on uh, most major buildings and, and cityscapes for holding trees in place. It's an underground system. That, uh, that we still run today called the Root Anchor. And then today with Love Handle, it's, uh, we're number two in the space, but shooting to be number one in the smartphone accessory business. Not, we're unique in that we have developed not just great products, a low profile smartphone grip that fits on any phone or tablet, but also we just released the, the Love Handle Pro, which is like a kickstand version and you can prop it up like so. It's really nice mm -hmm. and functional mm -hmm. and it's magnetic, but Really what we're trying to do is just add value to the world through physical products. And that's kind of my expertise. Uh, I've, I've launched a lot of failures too along the way, but that's just, you're gonna break some eggs when you make an omelet. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of been my journey. So how do you come up with the ideas of all these, in, I would say inventions, all these products, how do you come up with the ideas? So most recently, the, the system that, that's worked for me is that uh, I'm just not smart enough to come up with them on my own. I mean, I can come up with a general idea of what I'm looking for, which category I'm looking for, but then I go searching for products that are already existing. And so what I do is I'll try to find a product that somebody's developed and maybe it's in the early stages. They're not sure what to do with it next. Maybe they've sold a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 pieces, but they really aren't sure how to scale. I'll license the intellectual property from them and then let them go back in the workshop where they're happy. So it's essentially a partnership with, with me as the marketer and business owner and them as the inventor. They get to do what they're good at. I get to do what I'm good at. And then together, you know, I try to make them a millionaire and then try to, try to do some good for myself along the way too. So how do you find the product market fit or how do you know whether a 
product is going to be a winner. Is there a pro process that you follow or certain guidelines or SOP that you do? Yeah, yeah you know, I'm looking for, for certain attributes. Uh, I want something to, that's demonstrable, something I can show and demonstrate. I want it to be relevant for the largest size of market. So I'm looking for things that uh, the most people have a problem that, that needs solved and that this pro product can solve it. I want it to have high margins, you know, around 90% margin is ideal because there's so many layers in the middle, especially as you build out manufacturing and marketing mm -hmm. and those layers that are required. And so I'm just trying to, uh, and then, you know, people just come to me or I'll have, you know, I had an idea with Love Handle. I knew I wanted to be in the cell phone accessory space. I knew that that would be a long-term trend that wasn't going to go away. And in fact, would be trending up. And I, and I tell people this, you know, it's important that you invent not for today. You need to invent for three to five years from now because that's mm -hmm. about how long it's going to take you to ramp up any idea. If you're building for today, three to five years from now, when you finally are at scale, you're going to be obsolete. So how do you get Damon John to become your business partner? Well, that's a, that's a great story, Alaric. You know, I wanted to do it the traditional way, you know, mm -hmm. go to Shark Tank and then pitch, pitch on the Shark Tank on the carpet like everyone else and, and pick among all the sharks that were going to give me an offer and, and choose Damon. Or maybe Mark, if, they, if Damon was out. But uh, as it turned out, they turned me down at Shark Tank twice, actually. Mm -hmm. I made it to the second round of auditions, but uh, di didn't quite make it on the carpet. But then something happened that doesn't happen. And that's when uh, Damon called me and said, hey, I want to do a deal with you. Uh, I got one of your products. I love it. I have it on my phone. My team has it. They all love it. And I know that you're a good entrepreneur and I invest in entrepreneurs, not products, but you've actually got both. You got a great product and you're a great entrepreneur. So how can we work together? So mm -hmm. we negotiated a deal um, off the carpet and it's turned out to be amazing. He's an awesome mentor and business partner and guide. And he's got an amazing network, obviously, of, mm -hmm. of people that can add value back to the brand. And so it's been a very much a win-win proposition for us. So how do you differentiate yourself from the competitors? Because there are a lot of other like smartphone accessories or phone holders. How do you differentiate yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, early days, um, we, were, we were the OGs. Like we were original. Us and our number one competitor, the Round Knobs, were out. The, we literally started seven years ago, the same month in 2014. And at that time, there was no cell phone grip category. It didn't exist. Mm. I mean, new, the, the iPhone hadn't been around that long yeah. and, you know, people just hadn't thought about it. And then when we first started, everybody's like, well, I don't, why would you stick something on your phone? That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And so we actually had that as a, as a pushback and all the way I thought my vision was to take this product and then create a category that didn't exist, which is like mm -hmm. the, you know, piece de resistance for someone to try to, as an entrepreneur, like create a category that was genius and magic. So what we did is uh, we got our ass kicked for the first six years because of our competitor went straight viral. But it was the best thing ever could have happened to us because it, 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 it created a credibility for the category, for one. And it gave us the time. And we, and we grew and we're, we're doing lots, many millions in sales, but not, not the level that they were at. But it also validated the market and allowed us to continued development on our product and make it even better and reshort. Originally, we were going to make it in China, but we decided to bring it back and make it in America with all American components. And so now we have the ability to produce hundreds of thousands of units a week with all American components. And through COVID, that was a huge win because people weren't able to bring products, you know, import products very easily and allows us to do small batch custom things for promotional or for branding. Like I could make it uh, custom ones for your podcast and you could get like, you could make 20 of them or 50 of them and you could give them out to your guests or give them out to your fans. And so it's, it's been a neat thing to see the product sort of evolve to become a marketing tool. And then also just sort of a mainstay in, in, you know, how people use their phones. So like how many units of this have you sold or how, roughly how much of sales, if you don't mind sharing some numbers? Um, yeah. For love handles. Sure. Uh, we just crossed over 7 million units that we've sold. Um, wow. So we average about a million a year, but uh, in, you know, units. Uh, last year, you know, we were, we were a bit, I'll give you a range. We were between four and 10 million in sales, but we're on track this year to do to 10 X that. So really, really excited about the growth and uh, the possibility 
now that we've added this kickstand, I mean, I can't overstate the, the value of yeah. a kickstand on a phone, you know, to be able to prop it up instantly for, for watching podcasts or for, you know, on clubhouse or wherever you are, you know, that's, that's one of those really like game changing things. So, so that's $4 million to $10 million. Do, that's dollars or that's units. Each piece dollars. Sells, yeah. Dollars. How, how much does each piece sell for? Is it $15 or? So yeah, they range between ten and twenty dollars. The original grip, the basic grip, is ten. Uh, the Pro is currently twenty, but it's about to. That's an introductory price, about to go to twenty-five. So wow. about ten to twenty-five dollars. And we have a, a, a family of mounts for like uh, for your car. Uh, we have we're about to release one for Peloton bikes and strollers and things like that. So we're really just trying to help people navigate life with a smartphone in their hand. Wow, I think that's amazing. Um, selling a selling a $15 product and you know selling so many units so how do you do the marketing and distribute the product so what mostly what we do is we do um, grassroots marketing and the, the, what we what we learned early is that getting physical product getting this product on people's phones was the best you could do I could tell you all day long about how awesome it is and you will never get it uh, you might but probably not and until you slide your fingers in and you real like you get that feeling there's something that goes on in your brain where you're like oh now i see i can flip it around and i can hold my drink too like that's awesome so what our goal has been to we've given away over a million units for free of six years and strategically both at trade shows when they were still going on but then now we have sample kits that go out every single day to, to lots of micro influencers and what we're doing is trying to let the product speak for it. And usually they happen to be ones that are standing in the mirror with, uh, you know, trying on outfits all day long, or maybe they're at the gym and that people, oh, next thing you know, it organically happens. Like, hey, what kind of case is that? And they're like, oh, it's not actually a case. It's this grip called Love Handle. And it's amazing. And I get a free <laughs> testimonials all day, every day. So that's that's been the kind of the core of our strategy is product seeding to strategic influencers. Got it. So the product sells, the product sells, the product, you know, and then it just becomes a viral, like it becomes like a flyby. Yeah. Got it. We say the more, the more you sell, the more you sell. I see. And um, so do you do it, do you distribute it like through e-commerce, like people buy it online or do you have it in stores? And yeah. So we, yeah, we do a lot, obviously um, on our website, lovehandle.com. That's where the most selection is. We also sell a ton on amazon.com. And we're, you know, fully brand protected. The product's fully patented and trademarked and copyrighted. So we have our own brand page there on Amazon. We do really well. In fact, we're in 14 countries now on Amazon. And then uh, in brick and mortar stores, we're in about 3,000 stores in the U.S. right now. But we're on track to add some very major retailers we expect would be in around twenty to 25,000 stores by Christmas of 2021. So do you have this internationally as well, or right now is it only in the U.S.? We do some international, yeah. We, um, we're in Europe via Amazon, a distributor there. We do some in Brazil, South America. Uh, we do Australia, Japan. Um, but they're all, you know, kind of early. It's, uh, you know, really a lot of runway left, I think, in those international markets. Got it. And so as an entrepreneur, what do you... Um, spend most of your time on in this business? Is it more of marketing or is it more of, what, what do you spend most of your time on? You know, honestly, lately it's been working on my business um, mm -hmm. and then trying not to get drugged into the business. So we're unique and I, I, it's like I run a, a manufacturing company and I run a marketing company. Uh, and then by the way, we also do fulfillment. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a little complex in that I'm, I'm constantly, I have 32 employees here right now today and you know I'm, I'm going around I'm, I'm their cheerleader I'm trying to excite them and make them you know feel connected to our purpose and our mission I do you know mostly I do our big deals you know I'm, I'm collaborating with I'm trying to you know sharing our story on podcasts and and, and and writing deals and reaching out to major retailers and so it's just it's a highly varied thing there's not even one specific thing it's probably more more marketing than anything but really just being a leader uh, of, for my team, because ultimately you run out of hours in the day uh, mm -hmm. yourself. And so if you can't replace yourself and scale people and, and put people in position to do the things that you would do, if they weren't there, then you'll never be able to grow. 
Got it. And um, so how is the day in your life like as an entrepreneur? Like your daily, like what time do you wake up? What's, do you have a morning routine? Um, do you have a nighttime routine? Yeah. Yeah. So I uh, typically wake up around 530 and I have, I'm a big believer in the miracle morning. So I have my routine where I, you know, I first start with a lot of water and then prayer and then I'll have my coffee and then I'll look through my goals, do a Bible study then I exercise and then I go in and um, typically listen to an audio book or some sort of podcast while I work out. And then I'll come out with three main objectives I want to get done for the day. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's how I start my day. Cool. Um, can you elaborate a bit more about a Miracle Morning? I know there's a book about it. Yeah. Can you elaborate more about it? Sure. Yeah. Well, The Miracle Morning is written by Hal Elrod and uh, he has a great story. I highly encourage you to check it out. Uh, but basically what he did is he looked at all the people out there that were highly successful and what does their morning routine look like? And for some of them, it was prayer. For some of them, it was exercise. For some of them, Mm -hmm. it was just taking on good quality nutrients in their body. And he took all these things together, writing down goals, reviewing goals. And he did, what he did is he he compressed all those things and said, well, if if one of those is great and made this guy wonderful, then why not do all of them? And so he, he boiled all these things down into buckets and then you create a sort of a structured plan every morning where you can start your day uh, with purpose and investing in yourself and rather, you know, you keep your, stay away from your phone as much as possible early in the day so that the, the world's not dictating what's going on in your brain and you're getting to do that on your own. So uh, it's a great, I think it's a great way to find success, whatever your success looks like, whether it's entrepreneurship or just life is to start your day off with purpose rather than just letting the ocean toss you wherever it wants to. Awesome. And we, what, what advice will you give someone who's just starting out, who wants to be an entrepreneur? What advice will you give them? Well, uh, just manage your expectations. You're going to fail. You will fail. I guarantee you're going to fail. But failure is defined only when you quit. So that's just a temporary part of the process. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to make mistakes, but you can only win if you're in the game. So Mm -hmm. just sitting on the sidelines with an idea, not good enough. You're going to have to be persistent. It's a long road. There's no quick routes to success in my opinion on and through entrepreneurship. So you're just going to be, be adaptable. Uh, you know, try to, when when you get knocked down, learn from it and then try something new in a better direction and keep looking for opportunities. And remember, in most markets, it's the, the guy that gets there first that wins, not the guy with the best product, the guy that shows up there with a product or a service that fills a need first that, that ends up winning. So do you think selling low ticket is better or selling high ticket is better for an entrepreneur to start off with? I don't, believe, I don't think it matters. I mean, the low tickets may be better because your cost of entry is going to be lower. So... And I always try to tell people, like, you don't even have to have a physical product. If you have an idea for it, let's for a physical product. You don't even have to, to go make one. Like, you just need to be able to see if people will buy it. So you create a website this afternoon. Let's say you had an idea for, for a product, Alaric. You could, you could make a Shopify store right now, mm-hmm. but have ads up by lunch and see if people are willing to enter their credit card and buy this mystery product that you've created. And that's pretty powerful stuff because then you can decide whether to deploy any more interest or time or capital towards that idea. Most people say, I have this great idea because it's a great idea to me and they'll, they'll do nothing about it. Or if they do something about it, they think their only step is to go tool up in China to make 10,000 pieces, mm-hmm. bring it in and mm-hmm. then go create the website to see if people are going to buy it. That's just like, you know, getting married without, ever, I mean, that's like an arranged marriage. I don't know, like it's not a good idea. To, mm-hmm. to do it that way, mm-hmm. test, 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 and then react. So roughly how much of money do you spend every month on marketing or advertising? Yeah. Um, it, it's very, it's highly variable. I mean, you know, it's in the six, six figures for sure. Um, but, you know, we're really to try to be smart. Like I believe in Damon's power mm-hmm. of broke book. You know, every dollar matters. And so we try to do really smart marketing. And, you know, obviously things like Facebook and Instagram ads work. And so we do that stuff. But we try to get more creative and more specific about what are the objectives we're trying to, to get 
to accomplish and then work from that objective backwards to how we're going to make it happen. And so it's highly variable and, uh, I, you know, we try to adapt and, and just do it the way we, we think is best. Can you share some numbers like how, how much, but how, how many percent do you spend on Facebook ads, Google ads, LinkedIn ads, you know, um, newspapers, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's typically about 20% of our revenue that we're going to reinvest back into marketing. Okay. Um, another, you know, 30 or 40% is going to go to overhead and then the rest we can, uh, we can keep. Got it. <laughs> I mean, every entrepreneur wants to, to make profit and that's, that's a good thing. Um, so, okay. When you run ads, are you profitable on the front end? Like that means let's say when you're selling a $15 product or a $20 product, it, you're already profitable on the front end or you make money from the back end? Well, we definitely look at the lifetime value of the customer, you know, and understand like most of our customers will purchase from us a minimum about three to four times over okay. their lifetime. So in the average orders, you know, 25 to $30. So okay. they're worth about a hundred bucks to us, let's say. And so I can typically acquire them for $10 to $20, wow. uh, which is a pretty good, pretty good rate. And, and we're getting better at keeping the customer because we're with a new product development. If we can keep them in our ecosystem, and keep launching new products that really do deliver on the value. Well, that's how you build a brand. And that's my goal is I don't want a one and done with customers. I don't want to just sell them a, a widget and then never, never talk to them again. I want them to be part of my community. I want them to participate in design selections and things like that. So for us, it's really important to, you know, engage with those audiences that we bring in. Uh, obviously we want to get them as cheap as we can. And so we try to actually activate our current customers to bring new customers. Because it happens sort of naturally anyway, right? Because they're sitting at dinner and they're propped their phone up on the table in front of them. They're like, wow, how'd you do that? And they're like, oh yeah, by the way, is this really cool product called the Love Handle Pro. You should get one. Here's a link. And we're actually now we're embedding NFC chips in here so that you can actually share the link wow. to our website by just touching your, touching your Love Handle to their phone. And then now they get like an affiliate commission from a, a now there's not a lot of physical interaction going on, but I think that'll become more relevant as uh, we all come out of the, the pandemic. But it's just we're trying to enable our our fans to create more fans. So, roughly, how much of commissions do you pay to your affiliates to do that? So they typically are going to get ten dollars for every order they refer to us. So oh wow, that's a lot. I mean, that's I mean, if someone buys a fifteen dollar thing, they also get ten dollars. Yep, that's right. But the thing is, most people don't only buy one. So they normally buy two or whatever. So it's per order. And uh, so it's re we really do try to encourage that um, people get out there. We want it to be a win-win proposition. We're looking at the long game for the value of the customer. So we're willing to, to really bow up and give a lot of money up front. Um, it does help that we have great margins because we've built all the automation equipment to make our product in-house. And so we're very efficient in that way. And so I can give away, you know, well, the $10 typically, you know, average order of 25, I'm giving away around half of my order when you take out yeah. shipping. Um, yeah. But I, So I can maybe break even or make a little bit of money that way. But really, it's the second, third and fourth order that I'll make my money. Got it. So what are your plans for the future? Have you thought of like going IPO or what are the plans for the future? Yeah, you know, right now we're privately owned and self-funded. So just me and my father own the company. We let Damon in because, you know, he's Damon John. Right? So there's three of us that own the company. Um, you know, people ask me that all the time. Uh, I've never brought in a dime in from outside money. Even Damon's uh, participation was him earning his way in, not with cash, but with uh, connections. And so I think that for us, my goal is to grow this company by this year to be a 40 to $50 million company. And then the following year to break a hundred million. So the journey from seven to nine figures is really what I'm focused on, how I get there and what that looks like and what kind of, you know, attention that we can gather uh, will sort of dictate our plans. You know, people keep asking me, are you going to sell the company? What are you going to do? Like I've sold lots of companies, but I don't think that you, and I, and I know people disagree with me, but I don't think you build a company with selling it in mind. You build a company to just have its own life. And if you end up transferring ownership to someone else, then that's that's fine. But that's not why you build a company. Got it. Can you take me through a, one of the process of like when you sold the company, just one of the case studies, how was it like 
was it a painful experience? Was it a good experience? How long did it take? Yeah, yeah some, some details, yeah. Yeah, so um, when we sold the, the Pivot Trim company, it was, uh, it was painful uh, in the sense that, you know, on, a, on an emotional level, it's like selling a child right? It's like you've got this baby that you've grown up and then you've seen it walk and then it ran and then now it's winning races and then you sell it off. It's like that kind of emotion. So you've got that kind of pain. It helps to get millions of dollars in your bank account overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, that's pretty cool. Uh, but then at the same time, it's like all of a sudden, like the music stops. What do you do next? And it was cool. Like me and my dad, we were partners. And so like he went home. I saw him every day at work. Like we're just together. We're, we're doing this. We're conquering mountains. Then he goes home. I go home. We're buying stuff. Like we're, you know, cleaning the garage. I don't know what you do. Like I was bored. And so that's when we started just saying like, let's, let's do it again, but let's enjoy the ride and let's not let it be so hard on us. So, you know, it's, it's money's not going to make you happy. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. But, um, mm -hmm it's you can still find happiness in the journey if you're willing to enjoy the process if you like entrepreneurship is not for everyone at all it's not for everybody you got i mean i was just this weekend i was up here for 10 hours a day i missed part of the super bowl because i i i wanted to clean my warehouse and get it in order the way i wanted to do it and that's just me and i'm i'm just my own type of entrepreneur i guess but you got to be willing to work. If you, if you don't like working, you just need to go, you know, get a cubicle somewhere. But uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur, then you better put your gloves on. So rough, if you don't mind sharing roughly how much of like, how many times of EBITDA do you sell the company at? Or, you know, how many times, like how, how do you base the valuation on? Um, how was the process? Um, do you look for a broker? Do you sell it directly to a, you know? Yeah. It's, it's been like different every, every time. I wish I got, a, I had a clear answer for you, Alaric, because sure. It's one of those, um, you know, like we didn't have a broker. We just had a lawyer that did it like la the last time we did. Um, we sold our company to our number one distributor and okay. it was a strategic purchase for them. They were a big New York conglomerate. So they had budget to, to do acquisitions. Our contract with them was ending. And so we were about to become a competitor to them. Mm -hmm. And so it made sense for everybody to exit. And I had already gotten all that. Like, I'm a, I'm a builder, not a, a runner. Like, I don't like yeah. to run businesses. I like to build yeah. businesses. And so I had already gotten, I had a, on my wall, I had all the accounts I wanted to get Lowe's, Home Depot, Walmart, Ace Hardware. And then I also got all the countries I wanted to get. My product was leading in Australia, leading in Germany. Leading, like, every, there was really nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I felt like I had run the race. So it felt okay to sell the company. But, uh, there's really no clear answer other than, you know, just try to find somebody that it's a, a strategic fit for them. And by doing that, then you're going to end up getting more, more money for it. So how long did the process take? Yeah. The whole selling process uh, from deciding about a year, to about, about a year. year total. Okay. Yeah. And do you receive cash in LOI all the way through? Do you receive yeah. the cash in one lump sum or do you receive cash in like trenches? Yeah, they they offered um, to do like a cash plus like stock options and things like that. But we chose just to do the cash only option. And yeah, I remember the time very well. We were actually headed on a fishing trip and when I first sold our first company, first big company. And I was headed to the fishing trip and, you know, my bank account was like not that good. <laughs> and I'm headed to the fishing trip. We're about to get on this boat and we're going to be out of the ocean for the next week i think away from cell phone service and literally as i stepped on the boat i got a notification the wire transfer came through my bank account went from practically nothing to a whole lot real quick and it was the the most it was an exciting oh. feeling it was like a, a pinnacle i guess moment but at the same time it became quickly clear that nothing really had changed like it was i was still me everybody around me the things that oh. mattered still mattered more than that money the relationships, the friendships, the love, the experiences, the fact that I'm still alive because you can't take it with you. Like you, it, 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 maybe it takes that moment to make you sort of understand that you don't, that money's not going to bring you happiness. Got it. And like, how was the process like um, handing over your stuff, your, your inventory, your, you know, all this, how was the process like handing the handover? Yeah, it was weird. You know, you're packing up, like we were packing our computers up. We we're packing up 
all of our inventory, all of our product development stuff, you know, and if you are going to sell a business or think you might, I can tell you now, you know, you need to keep good paperwork because the due diligence process is no joke. Like you're going to, they're going to want to know every blood type of every employee, like they're going to know everything uh -huh. they're going to ask for it. And if you don't have it, then you're really not going to be able to sell your company. So make sure you keep good books, make sure that you keep records of everything that you can prove the things that you say and don't overstate things because the due diligence process is no joke. So because you sold it to a strategic partner or like a strategic buyer versus like just selling it on the market, do you feel that you got more value or lesser value because of that? No, definitely more value because Way they more. they needed us. Yeah, they needed us for a strategic uh, play, and so they were able to acquire not only our product, but we I'd done a really good job of sourcing. So they were able to get to our source also for some of their other products that they're able to make very efficiently with a high quality source that I had uh, really worked hard to build. So you know, there was, there was just sort of these, and it wasn't just the product and the brand, but it was also the systems and supply chain I had in place that was attractive to them. So. Got it. So what do you think are your biggest strengths in entrepreneurship? Like versus every other entrepreneur, what do you think you're, you're, you're strongest at? I think, I think for me, it's, it's what we've got going here. It's a, the ability to connect with people mm -hmm. and, you know, it, Everything, everything you do is a people business and being able to build authentic relationships. I just try to be real with people and honest mm -hmm. and be my true self with people. And, and I think that that gives me the ability to connect because people want to connect and they're so used to the fake, the overstated, the, you know, the flashiness of it all that I have the ability to sort of break that barrier down quickly, build trust with people and then respect that trust so that we can then do more together uh, once we break those barriers down between us. Sounds good. All right. So if anyone wants to follow you, what are your social media handles? Yeah. Yeah, great. So um, on Instagram, I'm at Mike Watts. Clubhouse, I'm at Mike Watts. Um, on, you can just search Mike Watts on Facebook and find me there. LinkedIn, same thing. Look, look up Mike Watts love handle. You'll find me there too. So I... Uh, I probably should be more active, but a lot of times I'm so busy in my business, I don't post as often as I should. But please connect if you have an idea or you want to chat. Um, happy to help where I can. I just really do want to add value to the world. And if someone wants to get your love handles, where can they go? Like, yeah, so lovehandle.com. Love, love yeah, thanks. <laughs> so lovehandle.com. And um, yeah, go check it out. Shop if you have any ideas. The you know you can do lovehandlepromo.com. You can go and get your company logo printed. You can actually order a sample box for twenty bucks. You upload your company logo. We'll send you a sample box. You can try it. But warning: everybody buys the big box afterwards. So just go ahead and go for the big box, and then you you'll have the most fun gift to give away. I mean, there's really nothing more fun than walking. I don't care if you're in a restaurant or on an airplane or at a trade show. You go put a love handle on somebody's phone, they're going to instantly love you and be appreciative every single time they're laying in bed and not dropping the phone on their face and they're going to think about you. And it's just a very, very valuable marketing tool. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much for being on the show. For those of you who like this video, make sure you like the video, make sure you comment what you've learned and make sure you share it with as many people as you know and make sure you follow Mike Watts on Instagram and Clubhouse and all his social media handles. Take care. Thanks for having me, Alaric. Appreciate it. <laughs>